Hello, welcome to another lecture on viscoelasticity in polymers. Uh, there are several aspects of viscoelasticity that we are discussing uh, from uh, uh, linear uh, analysis that is useful for analyzing small deformation viscoelasticity which we term as linear viscoelasticity. Uh, we, we looked at experimental protocols which are used at uh, uh, arriving at an understanding of uh, micromolecular viscoelasticity. We also looked at simple models uh, such as Maxwell and Voigt which are used to compare the real uh, material response with respect to the idealized response that these models represent. And uh, all of this can be done uh, in a set of instruments which are called dynamic mechanical analyzers or rheometers. So, for more solid like materials we generally tend to use the term DMA uh, which we use uh, for analyzing the dynamic uh, response of uh, these viscoelastic uh, polymeric systems. Uh, for fluid like systems we tend to use the dynamic shear rheometer or just a rheometer. So, our focus now has uh, uh, been to look at uh, properties uh, of these uh, viscoelastic materials and uh, dynamic mechanical uh, analysis is a powerful tool to characterize the properties of viscoelastic materials. And we will look at this by uh, uh, first looking at uh, the predominant mode of testing which is used in uh, dynamic mechanical analysis uh, which is oscillatory testing. And uh, we will look at results of uh, the oscillatory test on a set of uh, polymers and see how the overall response of uh, dynamic mechanical analysis is closely related to what type of polymeric material we have. So, let us uh, begin by defining the oscillatory response. Uh, uh, in this uh, uh, lecture I am uh, using uh, uh, notation which is associated with shear deformation. So, as I outlined in the lectures uh, where we talking about experimental protocols uh, the uh, 45th and 46th lectures we talked about different uh, geometries and different uh, sample shapes which can be used and different modes of deformation that can be used. So, therefore, uh, tension is uh, used quite often for solid like materials, but uh, shear can also be used depending on the application requirements. So, gamma is usually indicated as the shear strain and uh, so a sinusoidal uh, input is given where gamma varies as a function of time and the amplitude uh, of uh, the variation is gamma naught. And uh, the stress response uh, which is the measured quantity uh, is also sinusoidal and uh, because it is a linear response the response is at the same frequency as the input is. Uh, however, there is a phase lag and uh, so if we were to plot the same uh, response uh, basically we will get uh, uh, a response which is slightly shifted in phase and so therefore, it will be 0 at uh, different uh, magnitudes and depending on the scale how we are drawing uh, again that may also vary. So, therefore, there is a phase lag between the stress and the strain. If it is a perfectly elastic material then of course, we know that uh, tau is equal to tau naught sin omega t for a perfectly elastic material. So, there would not be any phase lag. So, therefore, this phase lag is an indicator of the elasticity and viscous contributions and uh, you can uh, using the standard uh, trigonometric formulas of sin a cos b, you can split the overall uh, uh, stress into two parts, one which is in phase with strain and other one which is pi by 2 out of phase or 90 degrees phase difference. And so, this uh, coefficient which uh, signifies the in phase response which is like the elastic response is called the storage modulus because elasticity implies energy storage and therefore, G prime quantifies the storage like contributions, storage like uh, mechanisms in the material while G double prime quantifies the viscous or the loss like contributions and delta which is more often represented as tan delta. Uh, so, that it varies between 0 and infinity. So, 10 pi by 2 being infinity, 10 0 being 0. So, this uh, is basically the ratio of the loss modulus to the storage modulus and uh, all of these are functions of frequency. So, again uh, the idea behind this uh, oscillatory dynamic test is to vary the time, experimental time scale 
as we saw in case of creep or stress relaxation, I can do creep experiment for one hour or I can do it for 10 years or I can do it for millisecond. So that is the way the experimental time scale can vary, vary. In case of oscillatory shear, by changing the frequency, the time scale can vary. So if I do very small uh, low frequencies, then material gets enough time, just the way ear would give material enough time to respond. If I do frequency very fast high frequency, then I am not giving material enough time and that is like doing experiments at short time scales. So therefore, uh, dynamic tests can be done very easily and nicely using an oscillatory kind of an experiment. Uh, we can do both shear or flexural or tension, any of these, uh, only things that generally you will find different is the symbols that are used, but otherwise conceptually it remains precisely the same formulation. You can also have uh, the same formulation where stress is being applied and strain is being measured. So therefore, stress may be talked about as uh, tau as a function of tau naught uh, sin omega t and then strain may be uh, measured as a function of uh, some sin omega t plus delta. So in this case, we can define compliance for example. So here we define g prime and g double prime which are moduli. If we look at stress as an input variable and strain as an output variable, then strain divided by stress is compliance and then we can define in phase compliance or storage compliance and out of phase compliance and loss compliance very similar to what we have done. So I le leave it as an exercise that uh, you can think how viscosity can also be done similarly. So this we will discuss when we will discuss processing because during melt processing and during uh, 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 molding operations, the uh, polymeric liquids have to be handled and many of them have both viscous and elastic contributions. An analysis of that can be done using in phase viscosity and out of phase viscosity. So just think about how similarly using uh, these variables, what would you use as input to define eta prime and eta double prime and what would you use as output to define eta prime and eta double prime. And we will come to this uh, much later when we discuss processing and rheology of materials, polymeric materials. So let us uh, look at uh, the uh, oscillatory response of Maxwell model. Given that we have already seen that it is an exponential decay for stress relaxation and that decay pretty much depends on lambda at the relaxation time. And based on the relaxation time, the material is predominantly viscous or elastic. So we will see very similar uh, feature here that depending on the value of lambda and the relative value of omega that is being applied, we will again see more relatively higher elastic contributions or lower elastic contributions. So the overall stress, if we solve that uh, ODE uh, of Maxwell model uh, with uh, the condition that we just talked about here that we are applying a strain. Uh, which is gamma naught sin omega t, the solution is given as uh, this. So it is a time series uh, with both uh, sin and cosine uh, function. So there is an in phase part with the input strain and there is out of phase or pi by 2 phase difference part. And so uh, this uh, of course is G prime uh, and uh, G double prime is the loss modulus which is signifying the viscous contribution. And uh, if you look at uh, how G prime varies, uh, we can look at this omega lambda as a combination because if you see everywhere it appears as a combination. So if omega lambda is very large, what happens? Then you can pretty much ignore this one. Uh, omega lambda let us say is 100, then 100 and 101 is very similar. So in therefore in that case, what happens to g prime will become g max omega squared lambda squared divided by omega squared lambda squared because we can pretty much ignore 1. And so therefore uh, this becomes g max. So g prime becomes constant and that is a sign of elastic response. So higher uh, frequencies, we get elastic response from the Maxwell model. What happens at very low frequencies? When we have very low frequencies, then omega lambda is very small. So in that case, what we will have is omega lambda can be ignored as comparison to 1. 
and so therefore g prime will be g max omega squared lambda squared. So, actually in this case g prime is proportional to omega squared. So, for a viscous uh, response uh, g prime will be proportional to omega squared. And so, this is a Maxwell uh, model response. If you look at the g double prime, you will see that uh, g prime is proportional to frequency to the power minus 1 and it is proportional to frequency when it is very high frequency and very low frequency. So, you can again do the similar exercise and try to justify this and we can look at the overall response where uh, g prime increases as omega squared then it becomes constant which is the g max value. g double prime on the other hand increases with omega but it decreases as omega to the power minus 1 and in between we have a point where omega lambda is equal to 1. In this case g prime is equal to g double prime and both of them are actually equal to g max by 2 because if you have omega lambda equal to 1 then uh, g prime as well as g double prime are g max by 2. So, therefore, uh, this side of the frequency we have elastic response from the Maxwell model. This side of uh, the frequency uh, where omega lambda is equal to 1 we have the viscous response. So, that is the meaning of uh, time scale of experiment and the material time scale. So, if omega is very small then uh, because lambda is a given value we see largely viscous response. So, if I do the same experiment on a material where lambda is different then what will happen is the overall set of curves will shift to the left or right. So, let me ask this question let me pose this question and you think about it if I now, let us say choose a material which has a different relaxation time let us call it lambda 2 and let us say this lambda 2 is greater than lambda. So, we have already plotted this curve for uh, lambda. So, now uh, let us say lambda is somewhere around uh, in this case it is 1 because at one frequency omega lambda is equal to 1. So, lambda is basically nothing but 1 second. So, now let us say lambda 2 which is greater is 10. So, according to the Maxwell model how would the g prime g double prime look like and uh, you can think about it uh, the overall shape and overall uh, because g max is let us say remains the same. Uh, overall shape uh, will still remain the same. Uh, the value of g prime g double prime at the crossover point will also remain the same. So, the question that uh, you have to try to answer is uh, will the curve come here and this is where the crossover point will be or will the curve come here and this is where the crossover point will be. And this if you are able to answer then you will know what is meant by time temperature superposition also because different value of lambda also implies same material but at different temperature. So, if I decrease the temperature on the material the relaxation time may increase from 1 second to 10 second. So, I can do the experiment on the same material at different temperatures and I will get different responses, but I can shift them parallelly with respect to each other and obtain a master curve. So, this is the idea which is exploited in time temperature superposition as we will see later on. So, this uh, value where omega lambda is 1 is called the crossover frequency because it indicates uh, the time scale of experiment which is 1 over omega c. So, 1 over omega c which is the time scale of experiment. of experiment is the same as and the lambda is the material time scale. So, lambda over 1 over omega c this is equal to 1 at the crossover frequency. So, therefore, uh, both of them are similar orders of magnitude. 
So, in a dynamic mechanical analysis, uh, we are able to do this experimentally and a dynamic mechanical analyzer can uh, do this oscillatory testing on uh, polymeric and other samples. And generally, we have all the different modes that we spoke about. Uh, there can be a uh, flexural mode, which is quite uh, common. Uh, we can have uh, basically tensile mode or shear mode. So, depending on the application, any of these modes are uh, possible. Uh, geometry is quite often a rectangular uh, sheet. So, with a very small thickness and uh, significant width and uh, much higher length. Uh, generally, the frequency uh, of a dynamic mechanical analyzer goes from a millihertz to uh, uh, somewhere around 100, 200 hertz. Uh, because this is a mechanically vibrating system, uh, we cannot achieve uh, much higher frequencies. If you want to achieve higher frequencies, then you require uh, much more specialized uh, instruments that can do testing at around kilohertz. What we will see in damping applications is many times the, uh, the vibrations have to be damped which are at kilohertz and those kind of frequencies. So, that those kind of measurements cannot be done in a dynamic mechanical analyzer. However, since we can do time temperature superposition or frequency super frequency temperature superposition, we can by doing this superposition, we can obtain response at variety of frequencies. And we can, uh, as we discussed, uh, have uh, stress as an input or uh, strain as an input and therefore, conversely strain can be the output or stress can be the output. And generally, the temperature uh, uh, difference is uh, from uh, 15 to uh, uh, minus 150 to about 600 degrees Celsius, uh, which is the temperature of interest for most polymeric system. Uh, I do not know if you can think of why would uh, one want to measure uh, properties at minus 100 degrees Celsius for a polymeric system. And uh, that depends on cryogenic applications and let us say if it is a gasket being used, uh, we would make sure want to make sure that the gasket remains in rubbery state at even lower temperatures. And so, uh, for many rubber like samples, it is of great interest to measure properties at uh, extremely low temperatures. So, now we will uh, close this lecture by just looking at uh, both this uh, uh, storage modulus and the loss modulus uh, for uh, as a function of temperature for some uh, variety of polymers. So, for example, uh, if uh, we look at E prime and we start from a very low temperature and start measuring, we may see that there is a small change in E prime. And, uh, as soon as there is associated with a small change, we know that this is not associated with glass transition temperature. Because glass transition temperature, uh, because of the segmental mobility being allowed, the change in uh, storage modulus is magnitudes higher. So, therefore, this could be a sign of beta gamma transition, which is their secondary transitions. And uh, when we have a very drastic change, this is where the glass transition of the material is. And then as we saw in the previous lecture, where depending on the type of material that exists, we could have a variety of responses. And uh, so, all of these responses indicate whether the material is cross-linked polymer. Because in case of cross-linked polymer, the cross-links will make sure that no macromolecular flow is possible and therefore, there is a rubbery modulus which will continue. So, this uh, is the glassy modulus and this is the rubbery modulus. And if we have crystalline uh, sample, then again uh, the crystalline samples will uh, play the role of uh, junctions and therefore, again some amount of modulus will be there. But if it is an amorphous polymer, the decrease may be much more uh, rapid because molten uh, polymer will not really have a higher amount of E prime. So, we are looking at uh, basically gigapascals uh, of uh, uh, modulus when we have the glassy state. And then uh, when we look at the molten state, it, it is uh, megapascal. So, therefore, there is an order of magnitude change and uh, this is also could be in terms of uh, few megapascals. So, there is a drastic change in modulus as temperature increases. Correspondingly, if you look at E double prime, so that also shows uh, changes where uh, associated with uh, secondary relaxations, there will be a maximum and then there will be another maximum associated with uh, 
the class transition. So, whenever there is dissipation associated with a relaxation mechanism, we see a corresponding peak in E double prime. And similarly, if we look at uh, tan delta also, tan delta may also show uh, some features which are very similar in a qualitative way to. So, this is how uh, we can look at uh, different regions of viscoelasticity in uh, a polymeric material. We have basically glassy state or the glassy region. Then we have a transition region and this transition region can be about uh, 20, 30 degrees Celsius. Because of the kinetic effects associated with the glass transition temperature, this is not a sharp thermodynamic transition like a melting temperature and uh, therefore, the changes can happen gradually and uh, the transition region itself is uh, reasonably wide for many of the polymeric system. Then we have uh, the rubbery region. And then finally, uh, we have the melt region. And depending on uh, the type of uh, melt it is, we, we can have a, a, a flow which is more restricted flow and a flow which is more uh, uh, allowed flow because if crystalline uh, portions are there, then the flow is restricted and uh, if more entanglements are there, then flow is restricted. So, therefore, uh, the melt region itself can be split in further uh, regions depending on uh, the microstructural features which are present. So, you can see that uh, different regions of viscoelasticity can be used analyzed using this dynamic mechanical analysis and uh, other feature that you can see is the domination of uh, elastic in the glassy region and domination of uh, the loss modulus in the the viscous region. So, as the temperature goes up, as thermal energy becomes more and more accessible to the macromolecules, more and more relaxation processes can happen and dissipative response is observed, while at lower thermal energy, at lower temperature, more elastic response is observed. So, therefore, DMA is very uh, excellent instrument to try to analyze the viscoelastic response uh, using oscillatory as well as creep and stress relaxation experiments that we talked about earlier and is basically a workhorse to try to characterize the overall uh, viscoelastic response of polymeric systems. So, with this uh, we will uh, close uh, this lecture and we will continue our discussion uh, related to viscoelasticity with uh, looking at damping response uh, in uh, one of the next lectures. Thank you.